This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Big, warm, platonic hugs to all of you, including Daniel Dorado, Howard Yermish, and John Atwood. Coming up on DTNS, AI might not take your job because it's so darn expensive to run it. And a screenless smart device called Humane wants to be your future. Do you want it to be? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, April 21st, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Rebbit, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, I'm Len Peralta. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We are in a very Friday frame of mind, folks. If you're not a patron, you want to be a patron because I have no idea what's going to happen in the post-show extended good day internet stuff. But let's start with the quick hits. People seem pretty excited that the Wall Street Journal sources say that Apple plans to Sherlock the day one journaling app. <laughs> the supposed iPhone journaling app would be pitched as a way to address mental health, reportedly tracking your daily activity, providing prompts for you to journal if something's on your mind, based on your activities and who you're interacting with. All data would be kept on device and its prompt suggestions would be deleted after four weeks. As 5G is becoming mainstream, even if it hasn't achieved its full potential yet, the telecom industry is planning for the next evolution of the spec, which, as you may have guessed, they're calling 6G. Representatives from business, academic, and government interests met Friday in the U.S. to set goals and strategies for 6G development. Millimeter wave and terahertz radiation are candidates to be used in 6G. But right now, the blank slate is there. You can turn it into whatever you want. So... This is the very beginning of what 6G will be. Chinese telcos managed to take a leadership role in 5G development, so the U.S. is hoping to kind of steal that momentum back a little. A YouTube community manager posted in the YouTube TV subreddit that MultiView is now available for subscribers. Subscribers are also eligible for $100 off the NFL Sunday ticket, which is regularly $349. Um, that's a limited offer through June 6th. YouTube TV version 1.13 also fixes a few things. An Apple TV black screen startup issue for some folks, a 4K playback issue. It now also supports HDR. YouTube TV also promises is a bitrate increase for its 1080p content, although it's currently only being tested on devices with support for VP9 and high-speed internet. The Reddit post also mentions a 5.1 surround sound syncing issue that YouTube TV says it's preparing to fix. Now, you folks know electric vehicle companies are hot and competition's getting hotter. You know Chinese EV companies are in the forefront of that competition because we've talked about it here. But you'd be forgiven for thinking that those Chinese companies have retreated to listing their stocks on Hong Kong or Shanghai indexes, since that seems to be what the news has been telling us. However, Chinese EV company U Power, that's the letter U, issued its IPO on the U.S. NASDAQ and shot up 620% Thursday. In fact, trading of U Power had to be stopped 22 times to make sure it stayed under control. Now, big percentage increases aren't really that unusual for small stocks. U Power listed at six bucks, after all. But it is interesting to note a tech IPO and one from China doing so well on the NASDAQ. WhatsApp has a new feature to keep disappearing messages from disappearing. <gasps> if you're like, wait, why? Stay with us. <laughs> if you get a disappearing message that you then want to keep, you can long press on it and ask to save it. The sender who sent the message that's supposed to disappear gets a notification and can choose to let you keep it or not and let it disappear like normal. Saved messages will be displayed in a kept messages folder. Yeah, I guess that could be like if you're having an ongoing conversation and part of it is like, well, this part didn't have to be disappearing. You know, I'd exactly. Like to, right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Or like maybe we forgot, you know, that, yeah, this, this sort of didn't turn into off the record chat after all. All right. I get that. Let's get humane. Let's do it. Humane is a startup founded by two ex-Apple employees, and they demoed a wearable personal assistant device that does not need to pair to a smartphone and it doesn't use a touchscreen. It, we we don't know a whole lot about it except what we know. So here's what we know. In the demonstration, Humane's president wore it in his breast pocket, so pocket on a shirt, with a camera just peeking out over the top of the pocket. He tapped to wake it. He then showed it projecting a display onto his hand because his hand was in front of the display. When he answered a phone call during the demo, the display said that his wife was calling. He also pointed the camera at a candy bar and asked, should I eat it? The device told him, 
And this is, he says, based on his dietary restrictions, maybe you want to avoid that candy bar. He then said he was going to eat it anyway, and the device said, okay, enjoy it. He also showed the device providing a summary of work activity and translating his words from English into French. Invisible devices should feel so natural to use that you almost forget about their existence. Les appareils invisibles devraient sembler si naturels à utiliser. Vous oubliez presque leur existence. You'll note that's me and my voice speaking fluent French. This is my AI giving me the ability to speak any language. And you, having a chance to hear me speak that language in my own emotion and my own voice. So this was all demonstrated during a TED Talk, excerpts of which were published on Twitter and collected by Inverse. The Verge says a public release is intended to happen on Saturday, April 22nd. That's tomorrow. It's unclear how the humane device works, what the interface actually is, or what the tech specs are. It obviously uses some kind of language model and deep learning, but those were there were there were light on details on that as well. It's fancy demo. As TED Talks often are, Tom. Mm-hmm. But is this something we should be excited about, or should we just be excited about it? I can't tell. <laughs> I can't tell yet. Uh, I tend to avoid watching TED Talks because I feel like video demonstrations kind of play on your emotions and and get past your natural critical faculties uh, and make you feel something is more real than it is. And and I think a little bit of that is going on with this and why it's getting so much attention uh, because you, you can really make something sound great if you're a good presenter, which, which the president of humane absolutely is. Uh, I'm, Less impressed by the technology, which is kind of a bulky thing in a shirt pocket that if you have a thin shirt is going to fall out uh, than I am by the idea, by the concept of, hey, what if we get rid of the screen? How is that going to work? And that's where I'm like, oh, okay, how do you activate it? How does it respond to you? And you get none of that in the TED Talk. He doesn't explain, other than tapping on his breast pocket every once in a while, he doesn't explain what the interface is yet. So I don't know what other questions uh, you have, but that is one of the big ones that I have. I have so many questions. Um, at, at first glance, I was like, well, this is interesting. Okay, so you're not pairing with a smartphone. So it's pulling data from some sort of cloud service. I mean, it's pulling data from it's somewhere. It's probably got a built-in modem or something. Something sure, yeah. like that. Yeah, and the whole sort of, you know, the he, he's wearing a jacket, you know, that has a breast pocket. And, you know, I'm just thinking like, okay, well, I'm wearing a t-shirt right now yeah. that also has a pocket. It's <laughs> kind of flimsy. I'm like, would something like that work in this? You know, is this a, you know, a type of clothing that you'd have to wear? Okay. So take the clothing part aside. Yeah. Maybe that's not the final form factor, right? Yeah. Okay. But, right, but, the, but the fact that this is supposed to, the, the idea, and I think it is worth uh, looking at least some of the excerpts from the TED Talk because it could be a little confusing otherwise is, the, the idea is that you don't have to have um, something that is you pull out and look at. It's it's part of your body and you can project things onto your person or a wall or whatever and make things a little bit more seamless. Now, I don't know about y'all, but if somebody calls me and I'm re- realizing that I'm getting a notification, holding my hand out to see that my wife is calling because his wife is calling in that situation um, is not easier for me than to pull my phone out of my pocket and see the same thing. Oh, I disagree. It's easier to hold your hand than dig in and pull the phone out. I mean, it, the, the pocket isn't that cavernous. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's right I'm, there. Yours I'm, with, I'm with Sarah on this one. I don't necessarily know that I want a, another device because I'm still going to have my smartphone uh, with me. So I'm thinking that make the smartphone be the brains of this and just give me a very, very small camera potentially that I would clip to my pocket um, that would be quite small. But all the brain work is being Mm. done in the phone that I'm already carrying with me. That that, To me, that seems like that would just be a much more easy to use type of uh, device. If you're talking about an either or, right, then yes, I, I totally see what you're saying. But I think where they're going with this is this is an example of ambient technology. We want to have technology where you don't have to have a screen. So, yeah, this could be built into a phone, but it also could be built into glasses. It could be, you know, an earring. It, there, there's all kinds of mm-hmm. other things that you could yeah. do with it where I start to see like, all right, yeah, I don't need to have a screen all the time to interact. But that's where the TED Talk fell down for me is like he's showing me the effect of not having a screen and making that very compelling. 
but he's not showing me how that works. Like other than a couple of taps here and there, which I'm like, I'm not sure tapping on my breast pocket is, is the best way to interact. Right. He answered that phone call. Like it just rang and he said hello and it picked up. Am I meant to infer that saying hello when a phone rings, it'll by context pick that or up? Or there might have been a gesture that's cool, that wasn't but explained. Yeah, maybe there was. That's that's the thing. It's like, I want to know how that works. So this, maybe we're going to get more stuff, you know, maybe by now, if you're listening to our episode, you already know more because they announced it on, on April 22nd. But I, I, I would like to have a few more few more details about this. I I I am willing to say I like this as a concept. I like what it's pointing to and I think there's a lot of possibilities. There. Yeah, I mean I I guess the 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 thing I I was trying to compare it to the most and that would be a smartwatch. Mm. Um, my my Apple Watch for example, I tried to, you know, I I gave it cell service and so I tried to, you know, just live my life and leave my phone behind in certain instances where I really didn't think I would need the phone. You know, I can answer a phone call on the watch, et cetera, et cetera. And it's possible. Uh, all that stuff is possible. But in the end, I kind of was like, you know, it's better that they're just paired together. <laughs> it's just, I'm just going to need my phone for stuff. That may, not, that may not always be true, though. That may not always be true, uh, for sure. And and maybe Humane can, can help, uh, you know, change our minds. We will see. Well, so many of our listeners have been concerned about password managers, with good reason, and you still are. So the news of Proton launching its own password manager caught our eye on Thursday, and we wanted to pass it along. Proton is a Swiss company founded in 2014 by scientists from CERN to create a a secure private mail service called Proton Mail. We've talked about it before. Over the years, Proton has expanded privacy products to include a VPN, a calendar, a cloud storage service, and it receives funding from users through subscriptions and also funding by a nonprofit startup incubator, Fongit, or Fongit, um, that stands for (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to try to do my best Geneva French here. Fondation Genevois pour l'innovation technologique. Oui, mais oui. Yeah, that was great. Uh, bien sûr. Uh, its latest product is called Proton Pass. That's the password manager available to top subscribers in beta right now, uh, though Proton says it'll make it free to use uh, eventually for everybody and open source. Along with your username, password, and notes, you can add randomly generated email addresses to use as a replacement for your real email address. Uh, that, that's something Apple does with Apple ID. Everything is end-to-end encrypted with key generation and encryption happening on the device, as you would expect. Proton is, you know, right in there with the rest of them and and having the right security things pass keys aren't on aren't in there yet they say they're on the roadmap but they're not getting those anytime soon so that is a little bit of a, a downside uh, when you compare them but having this news uh made me think it was a good time to check in so let's let's start with rob where are you on your password manager journey it's a journey tom um <laughs> so I, I i was a huge last pass proponent I still have LastPass. I also have one password. <laughs> I also have Bitwarden. Oh man! But if, if but if I'm if I'm completely honest, I probably use LastPass the most. And here's the reason why: it I was such a fan of it that it wasn't just me. But I have a family plan, and only do I have a family plan. My parents have a family plan, and only do my parents have a family plan. My aunt and uncle has a family plan, and I am tech support for all of them. Mm-hmm. So. Trying to get them to move to something else when for them last pass, I mean, it took years for them to get on it. it it's working. It's kind of do you do you really have them stop using last pass to go to another to, you know, to another platform and risk not actually having a password manager? Because I think that that's probably where they would be. They, they weren't really super gung ho about getting on last pass in the first place. It was just me whenever I would have to share a password with them, telling them you really need to be using um, a password vault and password or last pass was the one that I actually used. So I'm, I'm all over the place and, you know, I would like to get off of last pass. It's just going to be really difficult because I have other people that I've got to bring along with me. And that's why you're doing one password at Bitwarden, right? Is because right. you're trying the other ones and, and seeing how they work. Uh, I, I just can't believe that Rob, after what LastPass did, uh, I, I know that they're actually very secure still, but I, they lost my trust in December with the way they handled it, which is why of course I am still on LastPass. I was about to be <laughs> like, where are you going with later. this, Tom? We use it as a family. <laughs> it's the same problem. It's the same problem as Rob. I keep thinking like, all right, we, we need to move the team over to a new password manager. And every time I think about that, I get a headache. Uh, yeah, and, right. and, 
And as the details came out about LastPass, it's like, well, they didn't communicate it very well. I don't love the way they handled it, but I don't feel like the product itself is insecure right now. I just, I'm a little nervous about what's going to happen in the future, but that allows me to rationalize kicking the can down the road, unfortunately, which I know, I know it's a, that that is not how it should work. But when you talk about like the same thing that Rob's talking about, I got to move Joe and Roger and Sarah and all of our company passwords off. And then I've got Eileen, you know, and it's, it mm -hmm. starts to become a whole thing. Well, and, you know, I used to use one password and manage to lock myself out of it, which, by the way, if you really lock yourself out of one password, it does not matter how much you plead to the company. They say, no, <laughs> you, you locked yourself out. And by design, you can never get back in. That's why it's secure. Um, but then mm -hmm. we were using LastPass for DTNS, which I started using for, you know, a lot of other personal things. LastPass works not seamlessly, but for the most part, pretty well for me. Um, I was not thrilled about uh, the, you know, the, the, um, the breach uh, from a few months ago either, as nobody would be. But that's the, it, it's kind of like, I think we're so used to in this day and age being like, you know, this service doesn't work for me. If a company's cool, they give you like a really good, um, I'm going to, you know, port all my data over to, you know, someone else, you know, good faith type thing. We well, can't do that with password managers. You have to start over. And maybe that's not a bad thing. It depends on what, you know, what you're going for. But yeah, for me, I'm like, oh, uh, you know, like sometimes if I have a spare hour in a day, I go, all right, let's go in and change some passwords. Uh, and I have like 600 of them. I mean, it's not that you can't export your passwords and bring them into a new tool. It's that then I have to make sure that I've reshared them and that everybody else has signed exactly. up on the new thing. Exactly. And they've installed yeah. the app. Yeah. And all the interface is a little bit different. Yeah. Right. It doesn't work right. quite exactly the same yeah. way. And, you know, it, it makes you get into that, you know, into that, that tech, uh, you know, area of, well, it was as bad as it possibly could have been, right? They're mm. not going to be dumb enough to do that, again, are they? <laughs> yeah, start to rationalize. No, I totally <laughs> yeah, agree you, you, in the you, same headspace as you. Te have. Tech rationalization. So it's like yeah. I, I just I don't know that I want to move. I, I, I do. It's just it's so hard. I don't know if the trouble is worth the effort. I mean, it's worth the effort if you think it is. You'd be hacked, right? But it's like we all kind of go well. Are we going to be that? That's, a, that's always the death. We're, that's we're a, any all... security arrangement when you go, well, that you shouldn't yeah. be doing that. That's I a, know. I know. Yeah. It's like, maybe I'm just lucky. Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's Maybe I'm just lucky is not good security prevention. It really but. isn't. No. If you, if you get to that point of <laughs> rationalization, change your password manager. Yeah. Uh, well, folks, if you like Daily Tech News Show, which I hope you do, uh, there's lots of ways to get it. If you've stumbled across it, maybe in audio, there is a video RSS feed. It's available at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're on YouTube. You can just subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash daily tech news show and get the show there. In fact, our YouTube channel also features Tom's top five, where I count down cool tech related stuff every week. This week, cult tech movies you need to watch. It's a, it's going to already had one person on Twitter tell me, uh, this has set my viewing for the weekend. Thank you very much. So get in there and watch Tom's top five cult tech movies at youtube.com slash daily tech news show. Generative AI news never stops these days. Uh, for instance, Google updated its Bard chatbot to generate, explain, and even debug code in 20 programming languages, Python, JavaScript, Java, C++. It can also write functions for Google Sheets. So we all know you've been listening to this show. The race is on between Google and the dynamic duo of OpenAI and Microsoft. We also know Meta's got AI chops lurking back there. There's rumblings from Amazon, even Apple. While most tech outlets talk about the ethics and biases of these tools, us included, which is important, there's also cost. The sudden popularity of ChatGPT means OpenAI servers are running at full capacity. Semi-analysis chief analyst Dylan Patel told the information that he estimates it cost in the past OpenAI around $700,000 a day to run GPT-3. And it's not getting any cheaper to run GPT-4. That's on top of the tens of millions of dollars to train the models. Microsoft's Athena chip that we talked about before is partly meant to bring that cost down. That's why they're designing it. But other costs are about to go up, right? 
Indeed. Stack Overflow has joined Reddit in planning to charge companies to use its data for training. Stack Overflow runs a forum where more than 20 million developers can ask and answer questions. And it's good info. Stack Overflow doesn't allow posters to use code generated by ChatGPT, however. So before we get to the question of should we... Uh, are, uh, you know, should we are going to get to the question of can we afford to do this? So, Rob, knowing knowing the prices here, what do you think? I am reminded of a Fat Joe quote. Today's price is not yesterday's price. And and I say that because I think where this really gets expensive, you hear $700,000 a day. Well, let's, let's knock that up to a million. So you're talking $365 million for this thing to be able to run. Um, but the cost of getting data to train it, I think you're going to see pretty much every company that has a large vault of data saying that we want money every time you, you know, to, to access our API in order to get this data to train, to train your bot. So I think at some point price is going to really dictate everything. I think we're going to see, you know, companies saying is the price of this, can we make, you know, can we continue to make money on this? You know, the question has always been asked, why don't you make the entire airplane out of which you make the black box out of? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, because every airplane would literally be a multi-billion dollar uh, vehicle flying through the air. It's just too expensive to do. So I think that if if the expense outweighs the, you know, you know, the poor here, you know, so to speak, that you might see some things start to slow down. That being said, I don't see this slowing down anytime, uh, you know, anytime soon, because I think these companies are going to figure out very quickly how to monetize this um, and charge people for literally being able to ask a AI any question and, and get back a legitimate answer from it. Yeah, Nick Walton is the CEO of a startup that does a dungeon game that uses OpenAI's models, uh, or did. They were spending $200,000 a month uh, to answer millions of queries, so they switched to another lab, AI2I Labs, uh, and cut that cost in half, but it's still $100,000. And he told CNBC, we joked that we had human employees and we had AI employees, and we spent about as much on each of them. So... This stuff, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's going to come down much in cost, uh, and it's 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 going to be expensive. OpenAI has been running this at a loss to develop it, and they're not going to be able to do that forever. They're already charging for GPT-4 with OpenAI. Microsoft is charging for, for things through Microsoft 365 and Azure. I, I don't know where that cost line is. I mean, I guess that if you were to compare what you're spending on AI – to human employees and saying, well, we're kind of spending the same. So, you know, like, mm -hmm. don't worry, humans, we're not really making money. You could argue that the AI doesn't have to sleep or take lunch or have a family. Um, so th there's, there's a little bit of that going on. But yeah, if costs aren't expected to come down, or at least not significantly, you know, based on the technology that we have to, to run all this stuff uh, currently, then then yeah, I don't know how worried I would be. Yeah, I, I think that uh, it's it's very difficult to charge people for things that they perceived as being free before. Mm -hmm. So although Chat GPT is kind of a new thing, and, and you know, just full disclosure, I just signed up the twenty dollar a month account for this because I want to try some really cool things and I want to be able to play with you know with the you know the four dot version. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it was it's twenty dollars a month. If they tell me, oh. It's two grand a month. Well, I'm just not testing that kind of stuff out anymore. I don't have yeah. that type of appetite to go and learn it. Now, clearly there will be some who will, but if it gets too expensive to where they can't offer a lot for free, because that's what people are used to, um, then this, like I said, I don't think that it's going to go away. It just becomes a very expensive tool, which people who need it, they, they use expensive tools. So it's, it's going to be around. I just don't yeah. know if it'll be around at the level and the veracity of what people are talking about it right now. They did a smart thing in leaving ChatGPT on 3.5 for free. And and that made it compelling to be like, hey, you want the better model? You gotta pay. Like that that makes right. sense. Mm -hmm. They can like, but like you say, they they can't do that forever. I, I'm not saying that AI is gonna get priced out of the market or anything, but I think I think it is important and our conversation is underlining that. Yeah, there's a limit to how fast these models can get good because it costs a lot of money to train them. That's why they Sam Altman has said we haven't even begun training GPT-5. We're just working on GPT-4 right now. So there's a limit to what they'll be able to do well. 
And there's a cost to it. This is this is not free. Even though ChatGPT launched for free, it, it, it kind of put it in our heads of like, oh, it's going to be like any web service, like search or whatever. It, it's not. It's it's there's a cost to it, and so that's going to limit what it can be used for as well. I don't think it kills it. I just think it limits it. Well, I don't know uh, what everyone's travel schedule looks like this summer, but uh, I'm you I'm traveling you, a bunch. Yeah. <laughs> well, then you might you might be considering travel insurance. Some people don't think it's worth it, but if you do think it's worth it, you have a few options, and you might want to figure out how to pick the company to trust the best. You don't want to spend money on insurance that doesn't end up helping you when you need it because insurance sucks when it doesn't help you. Chris Christensen has a good resource, if so. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. I'm heading back to Europe pretty soon, and with the trip that I'm going on, we're going with friends, and I think they were just a little wrapped around the axle in terms of how do you find the best travel insurance, knowing that we're traveling in a time that someone might get COVID and get stuck, and there might be additional expenses or trips might get canceled. They wanted travel insurance, and it's a good thing to think about, but how do you find the right one? And I want to repeat something we talked about once in Tech and Travel, and that is squaremouth.com. It does doesn't list all the different travel insurance options, but it lists quite a few of them. And it's a fairly simple site to compare different plans and find ones that have the coverage that you're wanting for the duration that you're wanting for the country that you want at the price that you need. Squaremouth.com. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Uh, I think a lot of people don't realize, especially because the airlines are really good at like selling you the insurance at the checkout that you can add another one. You don't have to use the one the airline gives you. So. I, I I bought travel insurance exactly once, but it was for a very long term, like a year of travel. Um, and it made sense. And it did cover some stuff that was stolen, you know, like electronics, you know, yeah. during that time. So that was worth it. But uh, for shorter trips, yeah, I'd be curious to know if you know, anybody has an insurance company that they have had good success with. Speaking of telling us things by email, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Charles had a thought about whether or not Netflix's increased subscriptions in Canada, which we talked about the other day, can really be tied to its efforts to crack down on account sharing. Charles says, certainly if a notice was sent and one more share add-ons came about for that account, you could say that the crackdown helped Netflix in that case. However, if a notice is sent and sometime later someone signs up for a new independent account, there isn't an easy way to know one way or another if it was a result of the crackdown. Yeah, so if you're still like, wait, what is he talking about? Uh, we talked about the fact that Netflix said that in Canada, where it did launch its paid account uh, service, that's where they try to crack down on password sharing and offer you the the option of adding people to your account for an extra few, I think it was like $6.99 a month, $7.99 a month, uh, that they saw growth in accounts in Canada faster than growth in the U.S. And, and Charles is pointing out like, yeah, but that could be for any reason. And yes, you're right, Charles, but the point is they still saw growth. Everybody had been saying, well, when they can't do password sharing, everybody's going to cancel their accounts and they'll lose. They didn't lose. Now, maybe they just added more new people than they lost people from password sharing crackdown, but that's still a win for Netflix, right? As long as yeah. the number yeah. is going up and you've got an apples to apples comparison when you're like, well, the U.S. didn't have password sharing crackdown and it didn't grow as fast. You, again, it's not for sure, but you can say, well, there's a no greater likelihood now that password sharing did help us increase. Yeah, I'm sure account. Netflix w would love to know if if I was if Tom was sharing a password with me, no longer does, um, and I sign up for you know one of the share add-ons, then the company has information like, oh, okay, that you know, what a nice activation. Mm -hmm. But then Good if point. I just sign up for Netflix later, Netflix is like, new user, woo. I could be completely making this up, but I am certain that someone in accounting at Netflix asked the question, why are we making more money? And the response was, because we're awesome. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> yeah, they, you someone, sound like somebody who's worked in a company before. <laughs> it, it, it a few. So, yes, yeah, some, someone is really trying to look at where is the money coming from. But at the end of the day, what the shareholders mm. are concerned about, we're making more money today than we made yesterday. And that's yeah. that's ultimately what they really care about. Yeah, that's what they're going to they're going to point at that growth for sure. Yeah. Uh, speaking of growth, 
I don't what? know how I'm going to make this one work. <laughs> okay. Uh, my appreciation for Len Peralta continues to grow. Yes. Very Damn. good, Damn. Tom. Very good. Love that. Thank segment. you. Uh, Len um, Peralta, you've been illustrating today's show. What have you drawn for us? Ah, uh, good old fashioned AI. It's been in my mind all this week with the uh, uh, Adobe Firefly beta that's mm. out there. Uh, also, just, you know, um, it's very interesting. Just uh, had a conversation yesterday about chat GPT and programming. So, uh, yes, I don't really know what's going to happen, but this might be uh, what sort of puts the brakes on it. This is, a, I call this a code in, money out. Uh, it's uh, it's just <laughs> open AI working uh, some Python. And meanwhile, yeah. all the money is sort of just piling out from the programmer you, th you think you're uh you're you've living got it dream. all worked out yes you're living the dream but really uh you're 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 losing a lot of money so i don't know i mean there's obviously upsides and downsides to both to open ai um oh so the money going out isn't going into his pocket it's just going out the door it's yeah, going yeah. out the door mm -hmm. yeah exactly it's uh not uh not a, not a great situation so i don't know if uh, you're interested in this but it is available right now at my patreon patreon.com forward slash Len, if you're back at the DTNS lover level, you get this right now. Or if you like the old-fashioned way, you like to download or get a print signed by me, even you go to uh, lenparalthestore.com, where I'm currently taking commissions. So think about that as well as we enter in the graduation, grad, dad, mom, birthdays, all those good times. Uh, I think great, unique gifts are always uh, on the horizon there, so... Indeed. Uh, also a dad and also one of our favorite people to join us on the show, Rob Dunwood. Rob, tell people where to keep up with your latest. Well, you can find me pretty much all around the web. I am at the SMR podcast. That is smrpodcast.com. I'm at the tech John. That is the tech John, the tech J-A-W-N. And I'm pretty much everywhere at Rob Dunwood. I'm looking here. It's like, you know, at Rob Dunwood. If you go to Twitter, I do have a blue check bar. Don't. Don't think less of me. Oh. But I'm, I'm, I, am, I am on Mastodon. Are you a Mastodon. bot? Yeah, I do have. I, I bought it for a year and I can't turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wonder how many people are like, oh man, I was just there and now I have to deal with all this. Sh anyway, go mm. on. Please, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> or I'll go on. Uh, well, uh, good, uh, good, good on you, Rob, for being with us today. Check mark or not, we'll have you. We'll also have Marlon Thompson, one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. I guess Marlon is having us, really. Marlon, thank you for all the years of support. Indeed, uh, Marlon and all the patrons stick around for the extended show. Good day, Internet. Uh, we're going to be talking about mad scientists, heroes of our time, or both. Our Friday quiz tests the panel's knowledge of the entire history of modern medicine. The quiz doctor is in, folks. Stick around. You can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We hope you have a wonderful weekend. We'll be back on Monday talking about if gamers over 50 are overlooked with Scott Johnson and Brian Ibbett joining us. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott is one, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew Jay Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Contributors in this week's show included Justin Robert Young, Scott Johnson, Megan Maroney, Rob Dunwood, and Chris Christensen. Our guests this week were Annalie Newitz and Ruby Justice Thalo. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>